Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Zena Suisa. I'm an executive coach and psychologist and president of Resonance Executive and Team Coaching. I have with me as my guest and prepare to be impressed, Liz Wiseman of the, of the Wiseman Group. However, I rarely read, but I'd like to read, read you her bio, if you're okay with that, Liz. Okay, so Liz Wiseman um, is the former executive of Oracle Corporation, VP of Oracle University, global leader of HR development, human resources development at Oracle. After Oracle, she founded the Wiseman Group based in Silicon Valley. As a coach and consultant of the Wiseman Group, her clients include Apple, AT&T, Disney, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Salesforce, Tesla, Twitter, and I'm sure others. She was named as one of the top 10 thinkers in the world. She's published several books. I have two behind me. One is called Multipliers, and one is called Multipliers More for the Educational Setting. Um, she's been a guest lecturer at universities, and with such a busy schedule, she managed to raise four kids. And I think she's super amazing. Okay. From the time she spent, now this is me as, as a psychologist slash researcher, I, I know that what was driving her, and I'm playing into you, but I believe what was driving you is to find out what amplifies intelligence and brings out the genius out of people and doesn't drain, drain leaders. Um, so my first question to you, Liz, is can you, as maybe viewers have not read your book, and I encourage them to read your book, can you tell us the difference between a multiplier and a diminisher? Uh, um. Well, Zan, first of all, it's good to be here. Um, and it's good to be talking with you. So a multiplier and a diminisher, are there, there are terms that I used. I mean, I guess maybe I made up a couple of these terms, but it's to describe two very different kinds of leaders and particularly the, the effect they have on others. So my, my research, maybe the best way to, to describe these is where my research began. So my, my research began with this observation that there was a lot of... Um, latent intelligence inside of our organizations that sometimes a leader was so focused or even fixated on their own intelligence you know their own ideas their own capability that they overlooked the fact that the people around them had more to offer and and these leaders sometimes so focused on their own intelligence underused the capability of people around them and and i came to call these leaders diminishers because they drain the intelligence of others. And I think we've all experienced this where you've, you've seen like a really smart person come into a room and kind of just suck the intelligence out of a room. Yeah. And uh, then I noticed another leader, uh, equally smart themselves, you know, knowledgeable, capable, but they, they use their intelligence in a very, very different way. They use their intelligence in a way that that amplifies intelligence in others. Like when they walk in a room, like it's like you notice that people sort of sit up, they're more engaged, they're more forthright, they're more willing to speak out, um, to speak out against something even, that they do it in a way that people bring their full intelligence, their knowledge, their skills, their talents, their capabilities, they bring all of that to work. And, and I studied these two kind of leaders and they, they do some very, very different things, which we can talk about, but probably what was most startling to me in the research is not that they operate in different ways. That was obvious. I could, I could see it. And then I studied it. It's that they get to different levels of capability yeah. from people around them where these multipliers get virtually all of people's capability, whereas these diminishing leaders get less than half. 48% is what came out of my research. And it just, it struck me. I'm like, wow, it's like, the companies are are paying a dollar yeah. for someone and getting 48 cents of value in return. And then, you know, so there's this economic issue for the company, but then when you look at what it's like to go into work every day wanting to contribute, but only able to use half of your capability, I mean, it's, kind of, it's more than a disheartening experience. Yeah, for you, I can I can see that even when you're talking. As far as the, you've given us a little bit of a understanding between a multiplier and diminishing, again, people have to read the book to understand more. Um, the mindset, I'm a psychologist, so I would look at mindset. What yeah. is the difference in the way they think in their mindset or their mind between the multiplier and the diminishing? 
Yeah, you know, let me let me share. Here's just a quick summary of what I found. I mentioned that these two different leaders get very different levels of capability. You yeah. see that in the charts in the middle, but yeah. you see the world in fundamentally different ways. And and this was what was so fascinating to me is diminishers seem to operate from a belief that no one's going to figure it out mm -hmm. without them. And you know, so you can imagine the kinds of things you do when you assume that no one's going to figure it out without you. You know. Um, the, the multipliers have a belief system that's very, very different. Their belief is that people are smart and can figure it out. And anyone who's uh, done any study of mindsets or just even some casual observations, probably familiar with Carol Dweck's mm -hmm. research on this. Um, and you know, it's funny, when I shared this research with Carol before I published the book, Carol was so delighted. And you know, she was delighted because in essence, what I had done, I didn't realize I had done it at the time. But what I had done is I had looked at what you know, Carol's work is what happens when we believe that intelligence can be grown, yep. that we can get smarter and more capable? How does it affect our world? And versus, you know, what happens when we believe that intelligence is fixed? Like you're either smart or you're not. And, and what that does to our ability to learn and to achieve. Well, an exercise I did is looked at what happens when a, a leader believes that, not only about themselves, but about the people around them. And it causes them to lead and operate in very, very different ways. Um, there's five big differences that I found. The first is the way they manage talent. The, the diminisher tends to um, acquire resources. They're like empire builders. They like to hire smart people, whereas the multiplier utilizes people's genius. That's what I call their native genius. Uh, the second difference is how, um, how they create a climate of work, you know, the culture, whereas the, the diminisher tends to create an environment of stress mm -hmm. that causes people to shut down. The multiplier creates an environment of safety, mm -hmm. and not just um, emotional safety, and not safety, perhaps the way we talk about it on college campuses, right. people having like sort of safe spaces and not being really triggered by things, but intellectual safety, meaning it's safe for me to speak out. It's safe for me to disagree with the boss. It's safe for me to take a risk and make a mistake and recover from that. Um, the third difference is how they set direction and the diminishers tend to give directives. They're know-it-alls. They tell people what to do, whereas the multipliers tend to um, issue invitations. Uh, they invite people to explore possibilities. They they ask big questions. They, they, they're challengers to others. Um, the fourth is how they make decisions. The, the diminisher tends to make the decisions. They tend to be the decider, whereas the multiplier tends to be the debate maker. Right. And they get other people weighing in. Uh, it's not that they're afraid of making a decision, but they just generate it after the debate. And then the last thing is how they drive for results. The diminisher tends to be the micromanager. They get it done. Whereas the multiplier tends to be the investor. They give other people the ownership and the accountability and they, they ensure that other people get it done. And those are the five big differences mm -hmm. that I found that really create this very skewed level of capability that people exhibit around these two kinds of leaders. Yeah. That's, that's very powerful research, by the way. And um, going from there, and I really appreciate what you taught me, you taught my viewers, um, you talk about the accidental diminisher. Could you just elaborate a little bit on that? Oh, well, you know what, Dana, this comes really in the category of confessions of a social science researcher. Okay. Yeah, confessions. And, and this is, this is mine. You know, when I started this research, I saw these two very different kinds of leaders and I saw these diminishers and I could just see how they, they shut everyone down and they were the bad guys, right? In my story. Right. And and there are these multipliers, these good guys. And then um, came the plot twist in the research. Mm -hmm. You know, like when you're watching a movie and you uh, realize that the good guys just might be the bad guys. And, and what I came to see is that most of the diminishing that's happening in our workplaces, uh, in our schools, uh, you know, and in, in our homes, in our churches, yeah. and, and, you know, and, in our communities, like our nonprofits that are committed to like social justice, like in these communities, what I found was that most of the diminishing that's happening 
people being suppressed, kind of held back, it's coming from really good guys, like for, for people who really, really want to be good leaders. Okay. And, and what I found is that it's often with the best of intentions right. that we end up shutting people down. And I came to call this the accidental diminisher. And um, I just, I think I was really surprised to see how our best intentions can end up having really negative consequences in our job as manager, as executive, as father, as mother. So our best intentions, and I appreciate what you, what you shared, with our best intentions as coaches, how can we help the accidental diminisher to realize, to be self-aware that they're the good guys, that they have so much to offer? And it's all about a self-awareness because it's one thing for somebody to see how their bad behavior causes bad consequences. Like we can all see that. Like we learn it when we're, we're children, like, you know, oh, you know, Susie, when you hit, it causes this to happen. But it's really harder to see that when we're doing something good and well-intended, it can cause something to happen. But I actually find that once you offer this frame that our our best intentions can shut people down and help people see it. It's it's hard to see because these are natural blind spots for us. Uh, you know, isn't it human nature yes, to, right. to judge ourselves based on our intentions, but to judge other people based on their actions and their right. impact? So it's learning to see how this can go awry. Um, I've given. Some studies to this and seen some of the ways that this happens a lot and I've kind of given them some names and I found that these names really help people to see some of this now I um, I've got a, a picture of this okay. great let me see let me see if I can share it okay let me try this and let me share this this picture so got it so these are these are some of the ways that I see this happen a lot and I maybe what I'll do, we probably don't, um, you don't necessarily want me to go through all of these, but okay. I just really okay. start with a few that are my own okay. personal vulnerabilities. So if you, if you talk to people who work for me, they would first of all probably say, Liz is a huge idea guy. Yeah. So let me start with the, the good intent of the good idea guy. Like we love creative environments and innovation and we love to ideate. We love to get together and like chop it up and think about, hey, what about this? And what about that? And as bosses, we often come bursting into the office. Hey, I was thinking about this. Maybe we should convene a task force or maybe we should create like, you know, a survey to do this and toss out ideas. Now, here's the good intent, thinking that our ideas are going to help stimulate thinking like we're kind of just getting the party started but what's it like to work around someone who's a fountain of ideas yeah. you know we find that other people spend their days um chasing ideas like kind of like a rabbit chase like okay liz has got me doing this now she's got me doing that well let me try this and and people learn because people are really smart and they do figure it out which is this belief of this multiplier and people learn to just hold still or if people need to come up with ideas, it's a lot easier to walk down the hallway to the boss's office and get your ideas there because they're like a fountain of ideas, you know, and that fountain goes off every hour, like Old Faithful. Um, so that's one of my vulnerabilities. Um, another one of mine would probably be some people on my team would say, oh, Liz is an optimist. And you think, how could this possibly be diminishing? Like, I think every performance review I've ever had in my life has said, can do attitude. Right. Like I probably was um, blessed slash cursed with an overabundance of what Carol refers to as a growth mindset. It's like, hey, we can do it. We can do hard things. And we end up so focused on what can be done right. and what ought to be possible that we can often overlook the struggle of people around us. Right. I did one of my team who once like said, Liz, I need you to stop saying that. I was like, well, saying what? He goes, you know, that thing you say, you say it all the time. And I had no idea, no awareness to this. And he goes, oh, like, let me tell you. And, and it's, hey, we can do this. This can't be hard. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I do say that. You're right. And it's my way of saying we're smart and we're capable and we, we can do this. And he goes, Liz, I need you to hear this. 
what we're doing is actually really hard. Right. It's hard. And as my boss, I need you to acknowledge it. You know, and it's not like um, the people around me want me to become this like boohoo pessimist. I've learned to, to temper my optimism. And instead of telling people what can be done, I often start things off with, hey, guys, what we're doing is really hard. Like we might not be successful at this. We're probably going to make some mistakes. And this is actually going to be difficult. I spend a lot more time telling people, you know what? This process is going to be brutal and difficult. Right. And um, so those are two of mine. Um, one that we see a lot is, is the rescuer. This is the big hearted leader that hates to see people struggle. And they offer a hand of help thinking, of course, they're helping people be successful. But, you know, as a leader, we're typically most helpful when we don't help people, when we allow people to figure it out for themselves and get across the finish line on their own capability. Um, are there any of your, these that you are, want to explore? The, they all have a wonderful upside, but a, kind of a shadow to that upside once we're in the leadership role. You know what I often see in the perfectionist? I point. Mm-hmm. The kind yeah. of not good enough, you know, I've got to do better. And even if they're told this is good, no, it's not good enough, I have to do better. They undermine themselves. Mm. Yeah, you know, when I interviewed people about their experience working for diminishers, I heard this a lot. People would say, nothing I did was good enough for her. Mm-hmm. Like, what is it like to go into work? wanting to contribute everything you've got. And, you know, this is the thing I've learned about leadership right. is that people come to work every day. And this, this is in Canada. <laughs> it's in the U S it's, it's, uh, it's in the Middle East. It's in Asia. It's all across the world. People come into work with the same aspiration of wanting to contribute yes. and finding it painful when they can't, but what's it like when they come into work, wanting to do their very best and have, their very best constantly be not good enough. And pretty soon you end up in this deficit mindset and you play it safe and you go back and pretty soon their best isn't actually really their best. It's their safest. So I call, Liz, I call this, how does this resonate with you? Because I have this, I love this word resonate and it's the name of my website as well. What resonates with me is how open you are for for your employees to come to you, to tell you, Liz, maybe you can see it another way. You're so open to that. You're a realist. Well, you, you have to be. And, um, you know, it's funny. I, we could go back to my childhood. I was probably like dropped on my head as a child or something. But like, I think one of the things I learned as a kid is it was a lot more fun to sort of laugh at yourself yeah. than to have other people laugh at you, maybe. Yeah. Or, and I think it, the same is true as a leader. It's so much easier to see your own faults than to have other people secretly talking about them in the bathroom or behind closed doors. And, and I think a little bit of um, self-awareness and a little bit of self-deprecation as a leader goes a, a long way because people will tell you um, like I learned once from my team. So I hate micromanaging. It's, it's one of the things, if we kind of go back yeah. and we look at this down in the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see yeah. it's one of the things that diminishing leaders do. I was so happy when I saw it come out of my research because I really, I hate being micromanaged yeah. and I hate watching people micromanage their employees. So I really dislike this. Well, this was back when I was at Oracle Corporation and I'm running the yeah. education division for the company. And I, I'm in a a staff meeting with my management team. And for some reason, I am buzzed up about micromanaging. I'm seeing it more in the organization. And so I say to my, these are the the managers who report to me. And uh, I said, do I micromanage? Mm -hmm. And and there's this kind of like a little bit of a silence. And then this like roar of laughter from my team. They're like, that's funny. That's a funny question that you would even ask. They're like, Liz, you are the furthest thing from a micromanager. You, you're like, you don't have an ounce of micromanager in you. And I'm feeling, of course, very 
very smug, you know, very like good because I really, like I'm feeling self-righteous about this. I really just like micromanaging. And then they go, but, because there was more to the story. She said, but you, you could actually use a little dose of micromanaging. Like you, your problem is that you walk away. You give us hard things to do and then you go off to the next interesting thing. And they said, they all kind of gave me this version of this that we wouldn't mind if you stuck around a little bit longer or checked in with us more often because we often wonder if you even care about what we're doing. Wow. Yeah. Like, wow. And, and so it's a great example of exposing another accidental diminisher tendency. Like I was trying to give them space, but that space could be interpreted as, right. I don't care. Right. You know, I'm disinterested and that's not the case. I was like, oh no. And so I learned to adjust, like, okay, spend more time checking back, um, keeping that conversation going. Excellent. It only happens if people can tell you. And if people are not afraid to tell you, I think this is what I see a lot of too. They're, they're so threatened by telling you something because it's going to affect their livelihood. But you seem to be approachable and I think very self-aware and, and not afraid, not afraid. You know, there's, there's more to learn. Because I'm running a company, there's more to learn. Yes, but, you know, I see myself as very approachable. I think a lot of people would describe me as very approachable. Um, some people say, oh, well, you're, you're completely disarming. Like, you seem like you should be scary and you're not. But then I've also had people say, oh, you know what? I find you intimidating. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, wow. I'm, not, I'm like the least intimidating person. Like, no, I'm the opposite of intimidating. People say, oh, no, you're intimidating. Wow. And so then I have to dig in and say, well, tell me what that looks like. Yeah. I don't want to be intimidating unless I'm really trying to be intimidating. Yeah. And, then I might want to. and would they tell you? Yeah, they, um, they did. And yeah, I had, it was, it was an interesting little period in my life where there were three different people who all described me as intimidating. And so they, they talked to me and told me why that was. I mean, I can tell you, I don't think anyone's. No, no, I understand. Of that's that's a, a real learning for people to be aware to be open to um, feedback it doesn't work too it doesn't work one way feedback has to be two ways when i was a professor for so many years when they said to me well you know what uh, we'd like to learn but maybe we need more application of knowledge i had to be open to that it's not only reading off a slide you know we have different ways of learning and i had to be open to that so i'm going to ask you one last question liz yes Maybe before we go on to that last question, yes, it, getting and giving feedback is really hard. Yes, I find two things that are helpful. One comes from I've been um, reading Kim Scott's book, Radical right. Candor, right. and one um, there's so many takeaways from this book, but one that I really liked was just this idea. She refers to it as guidance. Mm -hmm. and getting and giving guidance is a lot easier than getting and giving feedback. Yes. Just like give me guidance on how to address. The second thing I would say is if you want to get more feedback as a leader, really focus on your accidental diminisher tendencies. Uh -huh. Am I a diminisher? <laughs> mm -hmm. No, not you. Of course not. Or even if you say am I an accidental diminisher, people will probably hold back and not tell you. Mm -hmm. But if you ask, how might I with the best of intention, be shutting down good ideas or energy or overlooking capability in others. When you frame it, asking people how your good intentions cause something negative to happen, people will tell you because it gives um, it gives a positive right. to that conversation and it makes it easier for people to talk to you. So it's the way we frame. The way we frame things is the way we ask, of course. Oh, back here. So my last question too is a personal question. You've done so much, accomplished so much, brought up four, I'm sure, amazing kids. Where are you going to be in five years? Well, I'm kind of a water along. Like, um, okay. I we will probably be doing... Um, I'll probably, I, I'm working on a new research project right now. Um, five years from now, I will have sent my last child off to college. So I will be empty nest or have some rebounds back in the house. Um, 
you know, I love my work. Uh, raising children has been the hardest job I've ever had. It's been the greatest honor that I feel like I've been given in life as a chance to um, to ready for children for the world. Um, but I hope in five years to be uh, at least two research projects in, you know, for continuing to study and maybe there'll be a couple more books, but uh, hopefully more research questions, more data, uh, more interesting things about how do we really use our intelligence and capability um, in work. So you've motivated me and I'm, sh I'm sure the viewers, and I'd love to challenge them and ask them what, what resonated with them? What do they walk away with? Because I think you've provided such a great learning experience as well. And I can't thank you enough. I started off by saying you're amazing. You were an amazing woman, a very accomplished woman, amazing. And to boot, bring up four kids. So parents, don't complain out there, please. Well, you and I both know, Zena, that, you know, the, that the leadership we need to be successful at work helps us in our homes and vice versa. Exactly. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. You really offered us a wealth of knowledge. And I encourage everybody to read your book. Like I said, it is extremely comprehensive. It has great, I have the updated version. It has great examples, activities in the back, which are very reader friendly and user friendly. Thank you. Take care of yourself. Thank and you. I'll talk to you one day soon again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.